Our guest today is Steve Cotter. And for more than 30 years, he has promoted body and mind fitness around the world through martial arts, qigong, mobility, flexibility, and kettlebell training. Steve works tirelessly to share the power of the kettlebell far and wide, and his efforts to teach his art form have globally impacted the growth and popularity of kettlebell training. Now think about this. His physical feats of power have led him to be named by Men's Health Magazine as one of the top 100 fittest men of all time. As a fitness educator, he has trained thousands of fitness professionals in over 60 nations. Steve literally wrote the book on kettlebell training, and his landmark Encyclopedia of Kettlebell Training DVD series provided the foundational instruction for countless trainers who learned how to use kettlebells through his teachings. More than anything, Steve loves to teach and to share his unique experiences to promote health, happiness, and longevity through fitness. Welcome to the show, the one and only Steve Cotter. Thank you so much, John and Drew. Uh, Really a pleasure to be here with you guys. Thank you. So I'm really looking forward to this today. Um, I first understood and got into kettlebells with John Brookfield. This is years and years ago and started off with just the the biggest kettlebells, you know, you can get. Um, In fact, it even started out a little bit earlier than that. I had a plate loaded kettlebell that I had made at a welder's uh, and it it banged your hands all. It it was, it was crazy. You put big 10 pound plates on it, but that's kind of where my journey began. Where did your journey with kettlebells, you know, how did that all come about? I mean, you are the master of masters. How did you get into using this unique tool? Well, I came out of uh, traditional martial art training as my my first foundation for, for physical training and physical culture. I was studying Chinese martial arts starting at 12 years, uh, when I was 12 years old. And, you know, I thought I was going to be teaching martial arts for the rest of my life as my career. And then uh, as I you know, was a, in my mid twenties, that sort of changed. And I realized I'm not going to be doing, you know, teaching martial arts, you know, as my career for the rest of my life. So I started to look for what was next. Um, at that point, now I'm, I'll be 51 in January. So this was going back until, you know, late, late nineties at that point. Um, When I was 27 years old, so this was 97, I decided to go to university and I was studying kinesiology out in San Diego, San Diego State. And so after, you know, going from from the age of 12 to about 27, I was basically training, you know, martial arts every day Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, training eight, eight to 10 hours a day between teaching and working out. And I was I was doing full contact kung fu as well and then i went from that to being a full-time college student first first child was born and so i went from training all the time to training very rarely and i was noticing that you know i was approaching my my 30s at this point i was noticing that my body was changing i was losing that that peak conditioning that i had sort of taken for granted for all those years and I was looking for how can I get back to that high level of conditioning? And I didn't have the time and I was sort of out of the, the habit of, of the daily training. And, you know, there's a there's a saying when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So right about that time, I started seeing uh, the first ads, which which was Pavel, Pavel Satsaline, who, you know, uh, really is he deserves the credit as being the, the person that started you know, the, the modern kettlebell revolution or, or, or sort of the uh, kettlebells that had been around, but, you know, the creation of the kettlebell market, that, of what it's grown into today. So he, he was the kind of the originator of that, you know, 20 years ago. And I was one of the early adapters. So I was getting the, uh, the catalog from Dragon Door Publications at that time. They had the catalog called Vitalics and I was on their mailing list and I would periodically get you know, martial art DVDs, because they weren't really so much in fitness at that time. They were more in, you know, Qigong and Tai Chi and these types of things. So I had bought a few products over the years and I started seeing these advertisements. This would have been probably year 2000 is when I first started seeing the kettlebell advertisements. And Pavel had his first 
book, which was the Russian Kettlebell Challenge, the RKC book. And it caught my eye. And, you know, the advertisements talked about how the, the Soviet strongmen would use it and the military. And it resonated with me and made a lot of sense because, you know, in, in those in-between years when I was going to college, I was going to the, to the gym at that time. It was 24-hour fitness. And I was doing kind of, you know, bodybuilding type routines that you'd find in the, you know, muscle media magazine. And that never really felt great to me. I was getting, you know, I was getting bigger, but I never felt it was compatible with the martial arts because it was more about isolating muscles. And martial arts is all about integrating and using your body as a, as a connected unit. And so the, the idea of the kettlebell made sense to me, but I, I had never seen one. I just saw the advertisement. So after seeing that for several months, I finally decided I, I need to get some kettlebells of my own. And so I, I guess I picked up my first kettlebell in 2002 and I just kind of did a swing, you know, without any instruction, just based on how the picture looked. And I immediately felt that connection, you know, taking a stance and feeling the power from the ground up coming through the legs. And right away I was like, okay, man, I, I love this. So I, I, I got Pavel's at that time. It was actually a VHS. It wasn't even DVDs yet. I have it too. So I got a VHS. <laughs> yeah. Of the, of the Russian kettlebell challenge. And I was just following along in my living room. I got a 16 kilogram kettlebell it was 35 pounds. And then I got a, a couple weeks later, I was like, this isn't heavy enough. I got a 53 pounder. And then about a month later, I got a 70 pounder. And that was what they had at that time. They only had those three weights. And so I was just training at home. And I learned, I, you know, I learned those basics very quickly because I had, you know, at this point, almost 20 years of martial art background, you know, so I, I understood movement, I understood flexibility and breathing. And after about uh, training for about a year, so I, so I got my degree in kinesiology when I was 31, uh, finished school in 2001, and I started working as a personal trainer. And I was working at a, a place in La Jolla called the Sporting Club. And, you know, at that time, it was functional training was just kind of coming on the scene at that point. You had people talking about, you know, some of the early pioneers like like Paul Check, you know, talking about this idea of functional fitness uh, as opposed to what people were more familiar with, which was more bodybuilding protocols. And, uh, you know, in the gyms at that time, it was they had basically barbells, dumbbells, but it was mostly machines. And so I, I started bringing my kettlebells to the gym and training my clients with that. And, um, you know, after about a year of that, I, I actually met Pavel at an event in early 2003. He had this event called the uh, TSC, which was the Tactical Strength Challenge. And I competed in that. I did real well. And I did one of the events was a pistol squat with the 32 kilo. And I did, uh, you know, and I had we, we did the one-legged squat, what's called the pistol now, but in martial art tradition, it's called the crane dip, mm. you know, and I, I was doing those for many years. I used to do like 80 reps per leg in one set. And then I saw Pavel talking about this in his, you know, on his internet forum. And, um, you know, so I did the first time I tried it with the kettlebell, I did 15 reps each leg with the 32 kilo. And um, so Pablo took notice of me. We, we talked, he says, oh, you know, you're, you're very strong and flexible. And he invited me out. It was uh, like two months later, he was having the RKC out in Minnesota. So I ended up going to his uh, RKC event in, I guess, April 2003. And, you know, Pavel at that point was, uh, you know, very impressed with me. He said, oh, you have really good movement. You're strong, you're flexible, and you know how to teach. Because I, I had also a lot of teaching experience teaching martial arts for many years. And so he invited me to come back uh, to the next course, which was in June of that year, and uh, as one of his assistant uh, or uh, senior instructors. So I started working with him for about three years, um, you know, so that, that's how I got into it. And then, you know, over time, I've evolved it, and I'm still very uh, active with the kettlebell. And, and as you mentioned in the intro, you know, I've, I've been around the world many times and more than 60 countries teaching, and I sort of put my own stamp on it. Uh, you know, because because I've always uh, viewed it as martial art, mm -hmm. and and that's really where I'm coming from. It's um, you know, so what I do is really the martial art of kettlebell, and and the and what I mean by that is every movement has an application, and you know, further uh, movement in general. If we look at fitness or strength training, 
if we go back in time to the origins, you know, to our ancestral roots, the reason why men would do physical fitness was specifically to be more combat ready. You know, now this is before, you know, firearms and the Absolutely. technology we have. If we go back, you know, many generations, people were fighting with, you know, swords and staves and bow and arrow and these type of things. So, you know, the stronger we were, the more fit we were, the more skillful we were, the better the opportunity we had to defend our tribe, to hunt and to survive. And so I've always sort of saw kettlebell as an extension of the body in a way that a weapon is an extension of the body. And yeah, so that's, that's sort of the uh, beginnings for me, which was coming on 20 years now. Well, it's so crazy because I can totally relate to your journey because kind of the same thing. I had read about kettlebell. I had two people I really were influenced in, I mean, and that was Pavel as far as what the kettlebell was. And as John Brookfield, which is a whole other thing. Uh, yeah. But it started out when I, when they first started about talking these kettlebells, the first book I ever had was the Beyond Stretching. And I read about it in a powerlifting magazine, believe it or not. And I'm right. like, who is I think this it was guy? Powerlifting USA. I heard. Yeah, I'm like, who yeah. is this guy? Because he's talking about things I've never, you know, heard of. I couldn't afford a kettlebell, so I told you I went to the welder, had him make me this crazy thing. It it, it was it was almost uh, not only was it crazy, it's pretty dangerous uh, because those plates start flying everywhere. And then when I could afford it, my very first kettlebell was the, was the 32 pounder, and so that's all I had. And so it was like everything had to be learned from that. And then I met John. And of course, the next thing I do is I order from Max Kettlebells. I order a 145 pounder and doing all kinds of just crazy stuff. It's amazing how it evolves. I mean, when I first got I think that started, was Dave, Dave Belomo, right? Yep, Dave Belomo. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Got these heavy. So I think my first set from him, I had 100 and 145 and 131, which is odd number. But <laughs> these were heavy things. And so when I first started out, I didn't know any better. I mean, I was doing the swing snatch all the time. So all my snatches were done with this massive arc, you know, which did build tremendous power, wasn't real efficient. Um, so it's just amazing how things evolve because I've watched the stuff that you do is off the charts. And I look at how things evolve from that very first VHS tape that was out there to where we are now and competitions. It, it just blows me away. And for those that don't know, can you share what you feel? Because I think I see a lot of people do a lot of crazy stuff with kettlebells that isn't really what they're intended to be used for. What do you see as the most important benefits of kettlebell training? I mean, we see people on TV doing stuff with crazy form, not using it the way it's intended. But I mean, can you talk about like work capacity, mobility, you know, in the martial arts, it's perfect for those that want to have that extension can you kind of talk about what the benefits are in your eyes with the kettlebell? Yeah, I would say that, I mean, um, first of all, you know, a person can do anything they want to do with the kettlebell. So I don't believe that we have to be limited that you have to do this with kettlebell or it has to be done that way. Um, whatever you do, do it well. That's, yes. that's the only <laughs> kind of guideline that I follow. Um, if somebody wants to lift the heaviest kettlebell they can find for one rep, rep that's okay but i also believe there is best use for mm -hmm. specific tools so so you know a kettlebell is only going to get so big and so heavy if your goal is power lifting you know a barbell is a superior tool for that mm -hmm. where the kettlebell really shines first and foremost is power endurance and you know power endurance because the endurance you know and, and if you the, the kettlebell as we know it is really comes out of the Russian kettlebell or, you know, the Soviet system. And I, I differentiate because there's different cultures that had weights that, you know, ha uh, weights with handles that were similar to kettlebell, but different usages, different designs, you know, like the Scottish have a similar weight that they use for throwing the Russian kettlebell specifically, it's a fixed weight. And so the nature of a fixed weight is if I have one kettlebell, it's not going to get any bigger. It's not going to get any heavier. So the way to progress is I have to increase the volume. I have to do more reps over time. And that was the original, you know, so if we look at like kind of the full strength training spectrum, 
you know, Northern Europe, they had, it's kind of like who could pick up the biggest rocks is the, you know, the guy that could pick up the biggest rock is the strongest guy, you know, and, and sort of powerlifting is coming out of that way of looking at things. It's like, okay, who can lift the heaviest weight one time? And that's how we're measuring maximal strength. The kettlebell culture is growing out of, okay, we all have the same size rock. So who can do it the most times? Yeah, so it's more on the endurance and then power endurance. And that comes really out of the kettlebell sport because it's a time limit of 10 minutes. It's one set and you can't put the kettlebell down. So if we have the same weight and we, and we have the same time, the winner is who can do the most reps in that time. So that's where the power, you know, because power is work per unit of time. So it's, it's really power endurance as the primary, I would say, uh, characteristic that we're developing to a high level with kettlebell and you know so a, a high trained kettlebell lifter you compare you know equal level power lifter is going to lift the heaviest weight the olympic lifter is going to move the fastest the kettlebell lifter is going to last the longest mm -hmm. is going to have the most endurance you know so they're developing different qualities mm -hmm. and i would i would say secondarily to the power endurance the kettlebell is tremendous for uh, load, what I call loaded mobility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so mobility obviously is movement, joint mobility and, and uh, dynamic mobility, but you know, obviously the kettlebell adds a load and it's really useful because of the way it sits. Whereas if we compare it to say a barbell or a dumbbell, you have a movement like the clean, for example, you know, you're with the, with the dumbbell and the barbell, the wrist is gonna be cocked back it's going to be putting a lot of pressure here. And then the elbow is going to be forward with the kettlebell. We can keep the wrist neutral and then the arm is connected to the body. And the benefit of that is that now the grip does not become the limitation because if you take say a 50 pound dumbbell, you do as many cleans as you can. You're more than, if you're fit, you're more than likely going to have to stop because you get your grip pumps and you, and you can't grip it anymore because this starts this starts getting all, you know, pumped and with the kettlebell allows us to relax the forearm flexors because of the way it sits in the hand. And so therefore the grip's not the limitation. So we can really train the cardiovascular to its full capacity, not, not stop because I can't hold it, stop because I've gone and, I, and now I'm just out of breath. Um, so, you know, the way that the kettlebell sits on the arm when it's against your body, when it's overhead it allows the load to be directly vertically aligned over the center of mass and base of support so again it's almost as just a, an extension of the body whereas if you did this some of the same moves say with a dumbbell your wrist is going to be in an awkward angle it's going to be you know very uh uncomfortable to hold for a prolonged period of time yeah, and there's almost something magical that happens with with we talk about work capacity. Uh, for instance, I feel like every athlete needs to do some sort of conditioning, uh, whether you're a power lifter, whatever that may be. And one of the things I like to do is I do sprinting, but it's really hard on your body when you're my age and my, and my size. But once a week, I always do a set. And again, I'm setting it down a few times. You know, this isn't without ever putting it down. But I'll do like five or 600 swings and then like 100 snatches. And even though that, I mean, I am heaving breathing-wise at the end of that, my body still feels good compared to doing sprinting. Like I said, there's something magical about you're building this work capacity, but you're not beating yourself up. Does that make any sense? I mean, I, it's hard Absolutely. to explain. Absolutely. And I, and I really um, favor the kettlebell for folks that, especially, you know, people that have really big frames and, you know, you take a guy that's 300 pounds that wants to lose weight and he starts running, his body is going to start getting injured. There's so much impact, you know, um, there's so much impact on the, on the ankles and knees, the hips, the spine, uh, the, the benefit of the kettlebell in that sense, if someone wants to, you know, let's say lean out and they're a heavy person, uh, there's no pounding on the joints in the way that running would, but it still gives you that cardiovascular component that, that VO two max type of conditioning um, that would normally be associated with something like running without, without the, the heavy impact on the joints. And, you know um, so, cause basically we're doing repetition, 
but we're doing re the difference between say the kettlebell lifter and say the marathon runner. The marathon runner is going to have a very highly developed cardiovascular, but they're not developing power. If, if anything, they're going to develop more of a catabolic Will they'll start losing muscle tone when they get beyond a certain level. Um, so the kettlebell allows you to maintain your, your muscle mass while increasing your aerobic capacity in a way that is unique uh, from traditional conditioning methods or traditional cardiovascular methods. And yet it's not, you know, one rep, put it down. It's like you said, you know, you can do five, six, 700 reps without stopping because it has that rhythmic quality and the design of the bell favors that rhythmic type of, uh, you know, what we would call cyclical training because the handle, the, the weight is in front of the handle. So it's extended beyond it. It tends to favors more of a sort of a swinging rhythmic movement as opposed to where the, where the dumbbell, uh, the, you know, the weight and the handle is going to be on one, one plane, the kettlebell, the handle and the weight are on two separate planes. And, you know, so it also gives you that window where you can insert the hand. And then, you know, then we have the variety. We, we can juggle it. We can throw it. We can oh, yeah. throw in cats. We can do partner juggling. So it gives you a lot of, and then also the design allows uh, manipulation of the leverage. And so if we look at, you know, because all strength training and all conditioning training is based upon the fundamental uh, guideline of what, what we call progressive overload. Right. And, and all learning for that matter. If we read the same book or read the same newspaper, we're going to stay at the same level of intelligence. So we have to constantly stimulate to, to create new synaptic growth, you know, mentally, but also physically. So, you know, traditionally, if we're looking to progressive overload, the most obvious is we can go heavier. In other ways, we can do more reps. Another way is, is we can increase the time so we can do the same reps in less time or we can do more reps in the same time. And yet another way is we can, we can increase the difficulty of the movement. So I can take a kettlebell that, let's say it's a 35-pound kettlebell. It's not heavy to press it, but now I can do a bottoms up where, the, where the, the mass of the weight is above. And so now there's a balancing and now all of a sudden the, the kettlebell feels much heavier just because it's less stable. Um, so yeah, you know, so those are some of the unique features that, you know, use the word magic and, you know, we don't, obviously it's not magic, it's all physiological, but, uh, if someone hasn't used the kettlebell before, it is almost going to seem like magic, the type of carryover that it has. And, you know, cause we are working, um, it's mostly ground based. We're standing on our feet and it's working, you know, a lot of different planes of movement. We're not just working you know, say a horizontal press and a, and a vertical pull and a squat, we can do those things, but we're doing a lot of vertical pushing and pulling movements as well. Um, the only thing kettlebells really lacks in the traditional movement, there's not a lot of horizontal movement in the kettlebell. Uh, you can invent them and you can do horizontal movements, but it's not so much focus. We're doing a lot of vertical movement, a lot of core stability movement, a lot of hip hinging, a lot of knee hinging. Um, you know, but like any tool, kettlebells can't do everything. It does many things and it does certain things extremely well, you know, but it, you know, in, in an overall program, it's an important, it's an important part of the, of the trainer's toolbox. If you want to really train all physical capacities. Yeah. I love that. You know, we're building these movement patterns too, that are just fantastic. And but we, we could talk about that all day. You know, people sit all day. So when you're getting that hip snap, you're doing some reversal with that, you know, with the hinge. I mean, there's so much good stuff. And another thing that I think is just amazing about what you teach is I want to get into a little bit about Qigong. Um, I love doing different types of martial arts. You know, I've been using the conditioning hammer, uh, iron palm, because I've learned to break bricks in my shows and these different things for years. Uh, the beading bags, all these things are cool, and they're all different forms of that. But you have a more of a, a softer form, even though you do do slapping. It's like nothing I've ever used that for recovery and for building internal energy. Um, can you demystify, you know, qigong for people a little bit, and talk about the benefits and why it works? Because 
everybody, I've had a group of guys one time, I took them through some basic routines and they're all like, I don't understand why I feel better, but I do. And I said, well, it's, it's, it's not mystical. I said, we're working on breathing, all these different things. I think it was uh, Mike Salemi. We we're talking about the difference between, you know, inner work and outer work. And this is that inner work. So can you kind of break down some of this for us and, and share the many benefits of it? Yeah. So, um, you know, when we talk about Qigong as a point of reference, the most recognizable form of Qigong that's pretty much uh, known around the world is Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. So Tai Chi is in its origins, a martial art, although the way it's normally practiced, it's not so valuable in that regard. Um, but uh, Tai Chi is actually a form of Qigong. And so if first we have to define Qigong, what does it mean? Because we're taking, you know, Chinese characters and trying to transliterate into English thinking and English language. Qi can loosely be translated as breath. It also can be translated as energy. Uh, so uh, the Qi is the breath or the energy. The Gong translates as skill or hard work. You know, so literally Qigong can translate as breathing skill or energy skill and the characteristics of qigong there's you know many many different forms or styles uh there's martial qigong there's spiritual qigong that's that's combined with meditation and prayer um there's medicinal qigong there's also healing types of qigong where qigong healers are able to use the the energy from their body to to facilitate healing and so the characteristics of Qigong is, first of all, uh, we're combining the breathing with the movement. So we're synchronizing the movement with the breathing. And the idea is that the slower you move, the slower you breathe. And the slower you breathe, the slower you move. And so uh, there's, a, there's a mindfulness component where you're focused on the awareness of the breath as you're moving through space. Uh, the movements are generally very slow and very relaxed. So we have relaxed movement. We have deep, slow breathing. And we're basically moving our hands through space slow enough that we can be aware, you know, so basically that the air that we exist in is like a viscous fluid. Um, it's not as dense as water, but, you know, it's that's why they're called air currents, right? So um, when we slow down, we can actually be aware of our hand moving through the air. We can be aware of the air moving through the fingers as we wave our hands. And so this slow type of mindful movement allows us to become more present of the breath. And, you know, in the last you know, definitely decade, but really last five years, there's so much more awareness about breathing now. And I, I would say that um, I would contribute that more to Wim Hof than any other single, you know, person. And there's, you know, a lot of spinoffs of that, but Wim Hof is the person that sort of made breathing sexy and made breathing cool, even though we've been breathing <laughs> since the beginning of time. And what he's doing is nothing new. He just has his own spin on it where he's combining it with the with the cold water immersion but you know his method comes out of the pranayama yoga traditions uh but you know there's a lot more awareness now in general than there was even a decade ago about the importance of breathing about the um you know so qigong has those same types of benefits uh there's increase in immune function uh so so there's improvements in the immunity there's uh decreases in the in the stress in the cortisol and stress hormones um so it facilitates what uh, herbert benson first coined the term the relaxation response so um increase in relaxation decrease in stress uh increases in immune function and you know western i guess western medicine has only really picked up on that in the last couple of decades to the point where we have a whole branch of medicine now in the West called integrated medicine, 
which was basically when, you know, uh, there was so much anecdotal uh, results of people gaining you know, increases in health and vitality through the Qigong that the Western science started looking at this and we, we have to try to understand this. And, you know, um, I'm not sure how many studies have really looked at scientifically measuring Qigong, but we have a lot of anecdotal examples of, you know, 80 plus year old people that can do tremendous physical feats when their primary practice is Qigong. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned the hard and the soft. So if we look at, you know, kettlebell and strength training, we can say that's the hard. We're, we're trying to increase, you know, um, power. We're trying to increase muscular strength. We're trying to increase force production. And then something like Qigong would be considered the soft, where we're learning to be more efficient with our use of energy. And, you know, so the analogy I like to use is, if you're just training strong, it's like having a big engine. It's like having a big truck, okay, with a powerful engine. So it, it can it can really uh, put a lot of output of power. The Qigong is the fuel efficiency. So if we have a big engine, but it runs out of gas quickly because we're burning energy quickly, that's not optimized. If we have a big engine, but it burns fuel very efficiently, now we're really optimized because we have the powerful engine and we also have the engine that is very efficient and not wasteful. And, you know, if we look at athletics, um, it, whether it's martial arts or MMA or, or you know, e even team sports, football, basketball, you see that in the early part of the game, uh, or the early part of the fight or the early part of the round or the match. Uh, everybody's feeling good. Everyone's strong, but it's in that last phase. It's in the last quarter of the game. It's in the last couple of rounds of the fight, for example, where that's where the conditioning and the efficiency really starts to show itself because I think it was Lombardi is the one that gets, you know, credit, but he's probably not the first one to say this, but they say that fatigue makes cowards out of men. Right. So um, you know, we're at a, at a level of comp competition in sport, the, the physical, the physical, um, characteristics are going to be pretty similar between the, the first place guy and the fifth place guy. There's very little difference in, you know, strength or speed. The difference usually has to do with a combination of efficiency. And that also has a lot to do with the mindset. Uh, how how a person deals in a pressure situation. In other words, are they able to stay calm under pressure or do they get easily agitated? Because and, and that's also where Qigong comes in because Qigong is a form of moving meditation where it teaches us that calmness of mind, that presence of mind where we learn to stay relaxed in any environment, in any situation. Uh, where an untrained person, they're going to get really agitated, maybe tense, maybe hold their breath. And at that point, you have the freeze response where you're not able to really move in the way that you've trained to move because we're just uh, overtaken by panic or anxiety or fear. And that, that ability to really breathe deep and just relax and stay calm, it allows us to sort of navigate the you know, what's in front of us. And that's tremendously useful for, for all types of sports and physical performance as well. Um, you know, so, so really to summarize, uh, moving slowly with minimal tension, coordinating the breath with the movement and keeping the body open, not, not constricting, you know, so keeping everything kind of rounded, uh, a mix a mix between hard and soft where it's not completely soft where there's no life in it, but it's not stiff. It's sort of that in between where it's, it's active, but it's still sensitive and it's that balance. And, you know, we, a lot of times younger athletes, younger men, younger women, they maybe don't pay enough attention to the softer component. And then we get to, to, you know, our middle ages and we start understanding that, Hey, I'm getting older now. You know, it's not like when I was 20, I can roll out of bed and jump and, you know, now I got to warm up a little longer and maybe I need to take some recovery days, right? And that's just a part of our uh, evolution. 
uh, you know, so at some point in time, we start becoming aware of the fact that we need to balance the hard driving go, go, go with some recuperation and regeneration. Hopefully we do that by choice rather than we have no choice. And now I can't lift heavy because I hurt my back or I can't, you know, run because, you know, I hurt my ankle. We, we start instituting these types of soft therapeutic practices, mixing with the hard conditioning. And, you know, that's creating a balance and we, we need that balance. Yeah, it's so true. And I, what I like about just, you know, going through some of these um, progressions with this and is that you actually are thinking about the movement. You know, we, we don't think when we breathe, you know, it's something we do all the time. We kind of go, and I've watched people go through, what I call mindless workouts, which I think can be very dangerous, but this forces you to think about movement for a second and to feel uh, one of the portions and at least the, the one that I've been, that you put out, and I said, we've done lots of different ones, but I love the one that you did with Mahler. There's a portion where you stop and just feel what, what does my That's body right. feel like? What, am, what sensations we've forgotten a lot of that, you know, that we, we did when we were younger. And when you're a child, you naturally feel all these sensations. And I just want to say, if you've never, you know, gone out and tried this, Steve's a great person to learn from. Um, I know he's got DVDs. Do you have this on your on your kettlebell DVDs? Do you have a little uh, qigong sequence? Um, I don't. I don't have really any qigong um, sequences. You know, I have a PDF that that I provide, and um, you know, I've done some. In I guess on the the DVD, I think the boys are back in town. Mm-hmm. Is the one that you know I did with Mahler years ago. Um, so I do have the sequence on that DVD, but yeah, I, I don't have them generally on the kettlebell DVDs. Uh, not because it's not complimentary. It is, it's just, you know, kind of stay focused on the, on the yeah. subject at hand. I think he, uh, Steve has some things. I think you have some things out on YouTube possibly. Too. Yeah, I do on my YouTube channel, which is just, uh, IKFF channel. Mm-hmm. So now switching back to our hard stuff, you know, during the pandemic, I've been asked by lots of different people, how do I get into kettlebells? Well, of course, it's hard to find one for a long time now. That's Um, true. People are starting to get into kettlebell training because they just can't get to the gym. It looks like for a lot of people, that might not happen for a while. What are some of – so somebody's picking up the kettlebell for the first time. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see when people start training with the kettlebell? Um, yeah, that's a really great point, John. Um, well, th- the first thing is doing too much too soon. And, you know, progress is something that we can measure over a period of time. It's not what you do in one session. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, really, you want to look at what have I done over this this month? And, and what's the progress over three months? And what's the progress over six months versus okay, I killed myself today and now I can't walk for the next three days, right? That's not really what what we want to do with it. So I'd say the the first common error is just moving up in the weight too soon. It's like, oh, okay, I can did five swings with the 35 or so now I go to the 53 pounder and oh, I did five swings, now I go to the 70 pounder. Um, That's not really the best approach. And then also volume, you know, not doing too much too soon, leaving a little bit of a, fuel in the tank you know the 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 term that pavo coined or at least he's attributed with his uh grease the groove Mm -hmm. right you know leave leave a little bit of something in the in the tank so you can come back and do it a little bit more tomorrow versus killing yourself today um and then you know obviously rounding the back would be another common mistake you know so you do movements like the swing uh the spine being the fulcrum we don't want that we want to keep a long spine and we want to really create the rotation in the hip so we're kind of hinging at the hip versus rounding the spine uh breath holding is another common mistake a mistake especially with overhead lifts so a lot of times people will you know holding their breath and you know versus continuously breathing throughout, never holding the breath at any time. Uh, and then uh, over gripping is another common mistake. And, you know, the, the reason is because the method for kettlebell is different than say the method for barbell training or powerlifting training. Uh, 
the idea in most cases is not trying to squeeze that handle as hard as possible because again we want to work a prolonged sets and build the volume before we increase the weight so i don't want to crush grip it where the grip is start burning and i start tearing the hands i want to be able to hold it with the fingers so that the forearm flexors can stay more relaxed and the strength is in the fingers versus in the palm uh, those are probably the four of the of the real common mistakes that that folks will make um, but in general in general master the movement before you look to progress the load because um, if you can't do it properly with a light weight it's not going to get fixed with a heavier weight it's just going to probably lead to injury over time amazing this, this is and, and gold yeah you're right on you know during the pandemic you know the kettlebells have become a lot more popular because you know most people they can't have a squat rack in their in their living room right and this takes too much space you just need a, a three by three place to stand and, and just a little bit of clearance overhead so you don't hit the ceiling and you can basically train your whole body at home with with one kettlebell so it's you know, become even more popular during this period where we're sort of quarantined. Which brings me to an interesting question because I'm really curious at your opinion on this. People are going out and buying kettlebells. Can you tell us the difference between a competition style kettlebell and one that you can buy at a big box store? For instance, all my kettlebells, and I have a, I have them from anywhere from 15 pounds going up to 145 pounds. You know, I've got the ones that are done in poods. I've got the ones that are done in pounds. Um, got tons of club bells. I mean, I love all these things. But now it's this whole idea that these uh, competition style handles can be, you know, purchased pretty easily. What's the difference between that? And for somebody, if you're going to start out, you know, in kettlebell and you never bought a kettlebell before, would you recommend getting, you know, that competition style kettlebell or just a regular you know, old school kettlebell. Yeah, I definitely recommend the competition kettlebell. And the reason is, uh, you know, first of all, what, what happened in the, well, well, the reason for the competition is because it's a standardized dimension. And even though kettlebells is still relatively new in America and most of the Western world, and, you know, and, and you know, the, the OG people in America doing kettlebells have been doing them for less than 20 years. But the culture goes back several hundred years if we go to Eastern Europe and, you know, the former Soviet Union. So all those, all that guesswork of what's the right design and what's the right shape, they kind of figured that out a long time ago. And they came up with what we call the competition kettlebell, quite because they've, they tested over, you know, many decades the different shapes and the different dimensions and the different, uh, you know, handle designs and come up with a standardized unit. And the benefit of that is that as you move up and down the weight from lighter to heavier, heavier to lighter, it fits the same regardless. Whereas, you know, and so a good analogy would be like an Olympic lifting. If you're doing Olympic lifting, it's a standardized bar diameter. There's a standardized height of the plates so that your starting point is always the same regardless of the bar, regardless of the gym. Uh, the, the cast iron kettlebells, you know, those are also good quality if you have, well, some of them are good quality, but the, the limitation of the cast iron is as, as the kettlebell gets heavier, it also gets larger. And so you have to relearn how it fits in your hand and against your arm and against your body. And every time you move up in a weight, you also have to learn a new position. Uh, so with the, with the competition kettlebells, you don't have that change. It's always the same position. The only change is, is the difference in the weight. And then, you know, if you go into, you know, other, you know, target and stuff, you have all kinds of weird kettlebells. And, you know, what happened with that was when kettlebells kind of came on the scene and then after they'd been around for, you know, a decade or so, all the sporting goods companies started saying, oh, we need to sell kettlebells because people are asking about kettlebells and they're here to stay. They're not going away. So we better get in on it. And probably, you know, the, the equipment sellers 
usually don't have a background in fitness or they're not really hands-on in the fitness. They're, they're on the sales side. So they're thinking about, oh, how can I make a, a unique design to differentiate from the competition? You start tinkering with that. You're also playing with the with the effect of it, of the results. You know, um, you start changing the shape. You start changing the way that it moves, and you know, so you get these plastic kettlebells with triangle shapes and all these weird, and and that's just from companies that have no clue about kettlebells or how to use it. Um, but you know, there there's uh, enough knowledge now that um, you know pretty much the main options are going to be the competition bell where they're all standard dimension or the cast iron where they're going to get bigger or smaller as you move up or down in load. Yeah. And with, the and I, I definitely prefer the com- competition. And does that make a difference too, when you're like sitting in the rack uh, position, as far as how it sits in your hand, you know, as far as re- where it rests to me, it looks like the handles sit a little differently when you're in the rack than the big, well, some of mine, I have some pretty fat handles on some of my kettlebells. Right, um, right. So, you know, like I said, so if somebody's starting out, you know, the, the, the difference, the cost difference really isn't that much anymore. Um, right, that's true. Things yeah, that, so the, the competition kettlebells are much more popular than they were, you know, even five years ago. And um, yes, you know, because you get, so basically we're looking at the, the window, the, the diameter of the handle and, and the ball and the space between, and you know, and that, that window between the handle and the ball that is where they insert the hand. So when you have a very thick handle, it's a more narrow window. Mm -hmm. For someone that's a large man like you, your hands are probably pretty thick. A thick handle, although it's great for grip, it's probably going to be really hard to get your hand fully. And we want to have what's called a deep insertion or full insertion where the hand's all the way inside and the kettlebell's hanging on the thumb kind of diagonally so that you're not even having to actually grab it. it. It can just hang. That's what you want. So you can keep the hand relaxed in that rack position or in the overhead position. Yeah. So um, there is a kind of an optimal and that's going to be in the 33 to 35 millimeter is I guess the exception of someone's strongman training, they don't care about kettlebell. They just want to work the grip. Then yeah, those thick handle kettlebells can be very useful from doing, you know, one hand swings. But if someone's trying to master the technique of the kettlebell, they need the right equipment. That's going to give them that precision. And that's where the competition kettlebells really rule is in the precision of the movements. So if you're listening today and you're starting this journey of fitness and you're going to do it, and you're going to make that purchase, get the competition style. I don't think that you'll regret it. I've heard nothing but good. You're confirming everything that I've heard. Uh, I think a lot of people will be happy with that decision. Um, and again, it's it's all about efficiency. To me, you know, there's a huge difference when I'm picking up, you know, the 145 pound kettlebell. It the the movement is not efficient. When the things that I've watched, you know, Steve is such a master of efficiency. If you want to see gracefulness, as soon as you are done with this, listening to this podcast or watching this podcast, go out and download some videos of Steve. The efficiency of his form and the grace will blow you away. I mean, you're just so graceful at it. And we talked about kettlebells a little bit. Today, one of the things I, I feel like people haven't mastered their own body weight. Can you give, because a lot of people are listening to this and they're like, what can I do in my house? Can you give just a few body weight exercises that you think, you know, if somebody's starting their fitness journey today, give them the most bang for their buck. I mean, I love all of your animal forms and all those different things, but what's just a couple things that people could do that, you know, if you're going to put in the time, here's some key things you could be doing. Yeah. Um, you know, first and foremost, you know, so again, the kettlebell is an extension of the body. So it's the body that is doing the work. It's not the kettlebell that's doing the work. The kettlebell is neutral. It's going to go wherever you take it. So, uh, posture is first and foremost, you know, so good posture for kettlebells is good posture for everything. There's nothing different. And so we want that upright position suspended from the roof of the head the shoulders are back and down and we sort of have our you know awareness of that midline you know which comes down from the 
crown point in front of the spine, out the bottom of the pelvis, down between your feet. And so that's our vertical axis. We wanna have that good posture in whatever we're doing. Uh, obviously squat is sort of a fundamental movement pattern. And I don't even consider it an exercise. It's really a human movement pattern because we were squatting before we had any instruction on how to squat. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, you know, in the modern world, especially in professional where you're going from, you know, kindergarten sitting in the cubicle into all the primary school, into university, into the corporate world, you know, you're getting in the chair and out of the chair, into the car, out of the car, right onto the sofa, off the sofa. So if you're not training the squat, basically your default becomes like a 90 degree and, and the hips start getting shorter or the hip flexors start tightening to where now a lot of times people by the time in their mid, mid 30s they've lost the ability to go into a rock bottom squat which is our natural inheritance because all you have to do is look at a young child that just started walking he drops his toy he's going to squat and do a perfect squat with with the body upright right without any training at all so we have that capacity within us but if we don't, as the saying goes, if you, you know, use it or lose it, if you don't use it, you start losing it. So we want to look at the squat and, you know, a really good one is the face the wall squat. So just stand in front of the wall, looking at the wall so that now the wall is going to block you from folding. And so you have to have that upright kind of arching the back. And that gives you that, you know, big chest cue that's used a lot, you know, the chest forward but really it's the shoulders back uh and then squatting okay so that face the wall squat is a great just postural check uh definitely a plank into a push-up is a, is just a fundamental upper body movement uh definitely a pull-up i say is a fundamental upper body movement if someone can't do pull-ups they can use a band to assist them uh but you know doing the movement pattern that, that's a you can you can develop tremendous upper body strength just with pull-ups you know um and then you know from the squat increasing the reps and then later learning to kind of squat on one leg first sitting into a chair then you know eventually working into a full one leg body weight squat um i would say uh with the with the body weight mobility is also very important. So if you're doing uh, basically a you know a push up, if that's too easy, one arm push up, pull up. If that's too easy, you can add some weights. Hook, hook a kettlebell under your foot, or or use a weight belt to add a little bit to your waist. Um, you know a squat. If that's too easy, a one legged squat. You know so just those three are, are fundamental. You know upper body and lower body conditioning, and then the rest I think is. Uh, to spend a lot of importance on mobilizing all the major joints of the body, you know, so rolling the shoulders, circling the hips, rotating the neck, just, just basic uh, ability to move your joints through their natural range without, without viscosity, without resistance, you know, just to, to feel good. And that's going to, you can also get it, get a little bit of a workout from that as well. You know, if you're doing repetitions of the mobility. So th those are what I would say are, are sort of everyday body weight things that, that you can do with minimal training. You don't need any equipment and it's always going to pay dividends. Uh, you know, from there, then we get into, you know, calisthenics where it starts getting more complicated, but have to start with the foundation. That's excellent advice. I mean, that, that's gold. And I want to ask you, what do you consider one of the best shoulder mobility exercises out there. Uh, guys like me have trashed their shoulders over the years by benching super heavy for years and log lifting and all the, and still doing some of those things. Uh, best shoulder mobility exercise. I, I'm not going to ask you to tell it, but I, the, the cups and saucers, can you explain to some of like the dynamics of what some of the best shoulder mobility exercises are? I mean, I use clubs. Yeah. Clubs are fantastic too. I use people laugh because at my house I've got, you know, the 45 pound club bell 
But I also have a pair of one pound clubs and people are like, what right. are you use those for? Clubs, right? Let me tell yeah. you, can you kind of, can you share a little bit about shoulder mobility and, and some of the techniques you use? Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the cup and saucer, the serving, serving tea is another awesome. way to call it a serving tea or tea cup exercise. So basically, you know, you have a cup of tea on your hand, right? And the only rule is you can't spill the tea so that this has to stay up. If I tilt it, it's going to spill, right? And so like, if I have my cell phone, I just need to balance it without cheating and holding it like that, right? And then I'm just actually moving it around in different positions where it's not falling. Mm -hmm. And you see all the range of motion that's involved in just this simple Right, you can reverse directions. And so if I tilt it, it's gonna fall. So that's how I know I did it wrong. So I have to keep that palm up. And that's tremendous for all the rotator cuffs of the shoulder. And then, you know, another real basic that I think is great for everyone is just doing circumduction. So, you know, take a long, like a, like a long jump rope or a beach towel and just keep the arm, elbows locked and just, you know, circle forward and back for repetition. And then, you know, gradually uh, bring the hands closer and closer. Then the same thing, figure eights without bending the elbow where you're circling it around both directions. Those are, you know, really basic, but great for upper back and shoulder mobility. Those are, those, those are go-tos for me. Dude, the, the cup and saucer. I just love that. The very first time I saw you, I don't know how long ago you did that. I started doing it with an egg and it almost becomes like play <laughs> after a while. You just do it and, and you don't right. realize right. how, but it will radically, radically change not only your mobility, but the health and how you feel and how you move. Um, Want to be respectful of your time. So just a couple more questions. What is something and, and what are you, you've done so much in your career. What are you most passionate about right now? Uh, you know, I'm most passionate about martial arts. So I, I got back into the formal martial art training uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And, you know, that's something I training almost every day. Uh, and I, I have the, benefit of training with you know two of the greatest uh senseis you know in the history of the sport the salo hibero shanji hibero both hall of famers many time world champions and, and i believe that um the quality of the teacher is more important than the art itself you know because it's uh different arts have different benefits but i'm most passionate in terms of my training uh in, of the martial art and that's really the center of everything that I'm doing in, in terms of my physical education. Uh, still love teaching. Uh, I, I love to have a positive impact uh, uh, to people in their lives to, to help empower them by giving them, you know, information that benefits them, that they can use and that stays with them and that they can use to, to improve themselves, their families, and, and also help you know, their communities. Um, other than that, you know, I'm, I, my, my girlfriend, my children, um, I love to learn. I, you know, am always constantly listening to audio books and almost all my waking hours if I'm not doing something else. So that, that's, you know, I, I have a pretty simple life, just, you know, family and family and uh, my, my teaching and my practice and my education. Those are my passions. Love it. I love it. Um, last question, just a couple things. Where can people go to find out more about you? And is there anything else that you want to share? Yeah, so um, my YouTube channel is a good place to uh, see some of the things I'm doing. That's the IKFF channel. And then uh, Instagram is another good way to, I put a lot of stuff there. That's just my name, Steve Cotter, IKFF on Instagram. 
uh, website is ikff.com. So those are the best ways to reach out to me. Uh, I'm doing a lot now. I, you know, during uh, this lockdown, I started teaching over Zoom. So I'm doing a lot of classes, certification programs, and um, you know, mobility and kettlebell and and uh, different workouts uh, over the Zoom, and that works really well. Uh, yeah, you know, what I would just like to share is that um, you know it's really important that we learn to love ourselves. It's really important that we, we learn to love ourselves and forgive ourselves. And um, I believe that we, humanity, in order to move forward, we need to learn to cooperate more. We need to stop seeing uh, other, and we, we need to learn to see ourselves in others and realize that there's not so much difference uh, you know, we, we may speak different languages. We, some of us are tall, short, thick, thin, uh, you know, maybe call God by a different name. But at the fundamental level, you know, and, and I gained this from experience through traveling around the world, that people are much more similar than they are different. And we need to overcome those differences or those perceived differences and understand that most people are not criminals you know most people are looking just to put in an honest day's effort take care of their family take care of themselves uh most of most people are not you know crooks and criminals <laughs> and we need to maybe stop paying more, so much attention to the mainstream media that's creating fear and division and you know um for those of us that share the passion for strength and conditioning and uh, health and well-being we need to use our strength to help others that maybe don't have enough strength to help themselves i love that i love that and i i've said it for many many years is that we're supposed to share our strength we're not supposed to hoard it that was amazing i want to thank steve cotter for investing in all of our listeners today thank you again steve for being on the show thank you so much john thank you it's really a pleasure. The Pressing Limits podcast is brought to you by ZionMissionaryChurch.net, where you can listen and watch messages, you can share prayer requests, or even find out how to plan a visit. And also by NeuroPowerSource.com. These are resources for your mind, your body, and your spirit. And you're going to find all the recommended supplements and gear that I use, including the Be Strong Bands, the new Juve 3.0 system, the Iron Neck, and more. You're going to be sure to want to check it out. Our podcast producer, Drew Kiespert, video director, Jolyn Thomas, head of talent relations, Mr. Fairfax Hackley. Be sure to rate us and subscribe to the Pressing Limits podcast. Follow us on Instagram for the latest episodes and more. If you want to find out more ways to watch, get on the Pressing Limits podcast website.